This is what's left of life in northern Gaza. Dazed figures drift past huge piles of rubbish. Those who survive Israeli bombs fear death by starvation. Scraps of paper, fuel to bake bread, if you manage to find flour, that is. The squalor here, filmed for us by some of the few remaining journalists. A quarter of Gaza's population is a step away from famine, and it's here in the north that the situation is the most dire. I hope this life will end soon. No one can handle it. We are trying and trying, but not succeeding. No food, no rice, no sugar, no flour. Blockaded by Israel, Gaza relied on around 500 trucks of aid per day before the war. But now, even as needs soar, less than half that number are allowed through, and barely any reach the north. Families have resorted to eating this wild plant as their main meal. The price of food is so expensive now, this woman says, because some are stockpiling goods or stealing aid. So this is what we eat. It's the smallest bodies that are bearing the brunt of the suffering. Born into war, it's a battle to survive, and man-made hunger is claiming more and more victims. For God's sake, we need food, pleads this boy. At Kamal Ledwan Hospital, more than a dozen children have died from malnutrition and dehydration, according to officials. Mothers unable to find enough food themselves, unable to feed their babies. Dr. Asma Horani has brought her own son into the hospital where she works, suffering from severe dehydration. She's desperate, but colleagues seem to know he's unlikely to survive. I'd give my heart's blood to help him, just so they examine him, but no one's paying attention to him. There's no baby formula, and we can't get a drip into his veins. There's no one, and I don't know what to do. There's nothing. Isn't the siege itself enough? They don't spare even babies. Only a third of Gaza's hospitals are still operating, and even there, only partially functioning. Imagine being sick and needing treatment here. Musa walked more than a mile for kidney dialysis today but there's barely enough power to keep the machines running. I don't know how I'll get back home. I don't know what to do. A life like this is worthless. We've reached the point of death. If healthy people can't live in such conditions, how can we, the sick, with no food, no clean water and no electricity? The skies above Gaza have brought so much death. Now, frustrated at Israel, America and others have been using airdrops to reach the starving population. The sight of parachutes sends a crowd rushing frantically to the site. But airdrops can't deliver the quantities that are needed. We've been coming to the beach for four days and this is all we've got. It's supposed to feed six people, it'll barely feed one. There are eight of us, and this is all we've got. Israel insists it's not preventing aid from getting here, but to many it appears another cruel form of collective punishment inflicted on Gaza. There's growing international pressure for more to be done. How many more will die waiting? Well, there's now a concerted international effort to establish this maritime corridor between Cyprus and Gaza, but it's not clear how effective it's going to be at bringing aid in, given the time it's going to take the Americans, for example, to set up this temporary pier that they've been talking about that's going to allow very large shipments of aid to be delivered. The 
very chaotic, dangerous situation when it comes to distributing aid within the Gaza Strip still continues. What would make, of course, a very tangible difference is a ceasefire. And that would also uh, allow at least some of the more than 100 Israeli hostages being held in Gaza to be released. But despite um, you know, uh, efforts to reach one, talks on that have largely stalled. Israel blames Hamas, but Prime Minister Netanyahu has been very belligerent. He has pushed back against criticism from President Biden over the weekend, vowing to at some stage go ahead with an invasion of uh, Rafah despite international criticism and vowing to continue opposing the creation of a Palestinian state. Thanks very much, Sekunda. Well, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Conservative MP, Alicia Kearns, joins us live. Thank you very much for joining us. First day of Ramadan, President Joe Biden has repeatedly said he thought there would be a ceasefire by now. Instead, what we see are appalling conditions in Gaza and a situation that can, in the absence of a ceasefire, only get worse, presumably. Yes, sadly so. And we should be currently focused on trying to avert a famine, which looks more and more likely. We have humanitarian workers who are now living off animal feed. We have children drinking from puddles. And as we saw from those scenes, the medical situation is an absolutely critical point. And the reality is the international community has had to move to a maritime corridor because of the failure to open enough land routes, open them for enough hours, for enough days, or to allow sufficient aid through. And this maritime route, we are still looking at a 50-hour journey to get boats across. And there are many questions I have around security on the beaches once the aid arrives and how the aid is going to get moved around Gaza. So we really are in a dreadful state. And, and yet Israel consistently says it is not impeding aid moving through to Gaza. Now, you've just returned from the Middle East. Is that true in your view? No, I'm afraid it's not. And I had an interesting exchange of views with the Israeli spokesperson on Twitter this weekend, which resulted in him having to delete some of his tweets. Uh, one where he claimed that if we were to test them, they could let through another 100 trucks a day. Another claiming that the UN had asked them not to de allow aid deliveries on Saturdays. This is not the briefing that I received from the UN. And it's quite clear from Lord Cameron, it's clear from Biden, it's clear from the Germans, the French, you name it, that everyone believes the Israelis could be doing more. But it's, but it's equally on. true, uh, when you mention Lord Cameron, that the Israelis do not appear to be listening to him, the UK government, or the Americans. I don't disagree with you. And I think these are the kind of conversations I've been having in Egypt and Saudi Arabia the last week. They've said to us, why aren't the Israelis listening to you? Well, the reality is we do have to recognise that the UK and the US... We cannot just force our allies to do things because we want them to do so. That is not the situation in which we are. Netanyahu has his own political interests and his own desires in terms of his future. And those are shaping the decisions that he is making. I mean, uh, you know, we have no ceasefire. Potential flashpoints now around the Alaska mosque. Despite glimmers of optimism over the last couple of weeks that this ceasefire would materialise, things seem to be returning to a very bleak point. Do you think there's now also a renewed danger of this spreading once again? So, look, Biden and the UAK have been clear that we don't want to see an offensive within Rafah. I don't see how that could be undertaken in any way that would in any way preserve or protect civilian life. Um, and so I think that remains a red line. We still have to remain optimistic of a truce. We need Hamas to agree to that truce. And my message is, while I was in the region, whether we need Hamas to come to the table or to agree to that truce, we have to hold on to that hope, because without hope, you can achieve nothing. But we also need to make sure that we plan for failure, which is exactly what we're seeing with this maritime humanitarian corridor, but also that we plan for if a truce does happen, how quickly we can surge that aid in, because I'm not confident there's an international relief plan being put in place, as there needs to be, should we get to that point of truce, which all the Arab nations want to see happen. I mean, yesterday, President Biden was being uh, criticised for slightly mixed messages over whether there were or weren't red lines. You know, he, he seemed to fix on a position that there shouldn't be um, thousands more innocent civilians killed, but at the same time, he would never leave Israel. Is that a problem? So I think there has to be a, a nuance in this where we recognise that Israel has a right to self-defence and we all want to see a situation, a future in which Israel's security is guaranteed alongside a Palestinian state. However, in that right of self-defence, we have to recognise it is not limitless. And where our friends and allies cross that line, where they start to breach international humanitarian law, not only do we have a responsibility to call that out, but it also causes the UK to change our actions and change our behaviours. And you saw that when we saw the Israeli minister come to the UK recently, where David Cameron essentially said in his statement that he believed that the withholding of humanitarian aid could be a breach of international law, 
I think that within the Foreign Office, they have concluded that it has been a breach of international law. Alongside the bombing of the British Medical Aid for Palestine charity, where we were very lucky that the four British nationals, the four doctors inside, were not killed. Alicia Kearns, thanks very much. Sorry to cut you off there, but I have to leave it there. Thanks for talking to us.